Today is Thursday, so we talk about success for Scrum Masters. We've been sharing success stories here on the podcast since 2015, so there's a lot to learn. But uh, wouldn't you like to learn from people with decades of experience? Well, don't worry, we've got you covered. The Scrum Master Toolbox podcast launched Tips from the Trenches, the Scrum Master Edition audiobook. That's version 2 now out. There are 13 audio interviews, 3 hours of audio with Scrum Masters that have decades of experience. We've got Mike Cohn, Linda Rising, Lisa Crispin, Christopher Avery, Emily Weber, myself, your podcast host, Yves Hanul, the editor of the original Tips from the Trenches ebook, also available with the audiobook. Altogether, 13 super experienced Scrum Masters. To learn more, visit bit.ly forward slash audio tips 2. That's bit.ly forward slash a u d i o t i p s and the numeral 2 at the end, all lowercase, all one word. So, one more time, that's bit.ly forward slash audio tips 2 to learn more. And now, on to today's show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Thursday, Success Thursday episode this week with Steve Silbert. Hi, Steve. Welcome back. Hi. So uh, Thursday is about success. And one of the tools we use to get to that success is, of course, the Agile Retrospective. So share with us, Steve, what's your favorite Agile Retrospective format and why? Whenever I interview Scrum Masters, one of the first questions I know I ask is, what's your favorite Agile ceremony? If they go retrospective, uh, I know that it's going to be a full hour call. If they don't, it's going to be about a 15 minute call. Um, because if you put a group of people together and say, look, go figure out how to work together, sooner or later, somebody's going to say, hey, time out. Well, it would be nice if how to uh, talk together. Okay, so then it's sooner or later, something like a stand-up would show up. Something like planning would show up. Uh, when I ask the second question is, what's your favorite uh, retrospective format? It's going to be a short call if they, if they say iceberg or sailboat. I want, I want people who have a closet full of games. Um, I, and I like to bring them out. Uh, I was at um, a Play for well, three years ago up, or up in Ontario, and I can't remember Scott's last name, uh, brought a game called Keep Talking and No One Explodes. Basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a bomb defusal game where you have the bomb on your iPad or your MacBook and the other people have a copy of the manual, which is the worst set of requirements and, and documentation you can ever, ever imagine. And, you know, the challenge is you can't see the manual and the person with the, uh, the, the manual can't see the bomb. So you have to learn to communicate uh, to be able to defuse the bomb. And I think that's a perfect analogy for what we do in work, whether it's software or anything else, is that especially with software development, it's, it's solving a complex problem in a time box. So that, that sets that, that, that framework for learning because the first thing that happens is everybody goes, boom, figuratively speaking, of course. And the second time, if you hold a one minute retrospective between rounds, they may explode, they may not, but by the third time, they usually have it. And then, then one, they're hooked. I remember doing an hour retrospective for three hours one day because they didn't want to stop. And two is as a facilitator, you can change the rules to adapt it to drive deeper and different types of learning. So with that game, what ends up happening always is that sooner or later they go, oh, um, Luke, um, whenever we get bomb module number three, it seems like you understand it the most. Uh, you take that and you talk them through how to diffuse it. So now they've siloed themselves, which happens all the times in our teams. As a facilitator, at the end of that, you can go, Luke's on vacation this round. And now what are you going to do? Now, as a facilitator, that's fun because, you know, insert evil laugh here. <laughs> but you learn there and the team goes, well, maybe what we need to do is to make sure that everybody has a specialty, but everybody can also understand how to work through all the other modules. In this case, if you're a developer, you'd be a great developer, but understand how to test so that we can swarm problems as a team or adapt. So, I mean, keep talking is, is so fundamentally 
usable in many different directions that it's by, by far hands down my favorite. By the way, I've done that. I've done it with distributed teams too. That's brilliant. Uh, that definitely, if you can send me the link to that so I can, I can share it in the show notes and get other people to <laughs> maybe get hooked on it too. Um, well, one of the things that you said about this uh, particular format or, or actually you know, more like a game, right? Because the format is all around that game. Uh, one of the things that came to mind is that it, it's also the, the power of analogy in a game that is time bound differently than than you know software development is right so yeah. if you look at software development as a collaborative game as as some people have said uh, then that takes a longer time but if you do this game that you were describing uh, was it called keep talking and no one explodes yeah yeah if if you do that game then then it it all happens in like whatever 5 minutes or whatever that is and, and you get to see those dynamics uh emerge and then you get to reflect on it right without the time pressure reflect and then try again then reflect and then try again it's almost like you're using the retro to practice the retro right and and there there are a number of things you know as i said in my introduction a few days before in this is that I, I really look at, at existing games and things to hack is you want to find things that have a natural time box and you want to find things that cross geographies, languages. Jigsaw puzzles is another one that I use um, because they're universal and, and you can drive, change the rules and really look at them and, and get a lot of deep meaning in a lot of different directions. And because it is an analogy, you can bring the folks out of that world of that game and talk about how they would apply it in their, in their team environment and what they're building on how to build things better uh, in understanding different roles. Absolutely. That, that's the power of analogies. All right, now we turn our attention to success and what success means for Scrum Master. And I have to say, now I'm interested in what the answer to that question is when you interview Scrum Masters that would keep you on the call for one hour. <laughs> I, I, I've kind of said this before. For me, uh, it's about how can I reduce pain in the workplace? Because we spend a considerable more part of our lives with, with people at, our, at work, whether it's physically at another building or through Zoom or whatever. Uh, so why shouldn't it be enjoyable? Um, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be just a paycheck. It should be a passion. The people that you work with, you should trust and love. And, and if you don't, you, there's pain in the workplace. So, it, but it's one of those things that it's hard to measure. I mean, I, I really believe that there are, there are some key metrics that we should look at in terms of uh, our ability to get work done and all that stuff. But the people side is so much more important because, you know, laptops don't develop code people develop code yeah it's not the keyboards that write the code it's the people yeah so so if if we if we have a lot of people that are experiencing what i keep calling pain in the workplace a workplace dysfunction uh i i don't feel fulfilled in my job i don't feel that i can progress in in my discipline i'm not allowed to try new things you know it, it, when people in boxes that are that are dysfunctional, it causes them personal anguish, and and that hurts me. So if I can start learning how to help people and teams and organizations unpack that uh, and make headway there, I feel that I'm successful, even if they're not all the way there. Uh, just to get them to the point of going, hey, you know what? Uh, maybe bumping my head going down the steps is, is not the right way to do it. <laughs> To use a Winnie the Pooh metaphor, absolutely. Yes. That's a, a great way to put it. Thank you for sharing that, Steve. Thank you. Part of a successful Scrum Master job is to help the product owner. Tomorrow we explore that critical role in Scrum, the product owner role. Tune in to learn about the product owner anti-patterns, what you can do to help the product owner, and a real-life example of what a great product owner is and what made it so tomorrow on our Friday product owner episode. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring. <laughs>